In this video, we are going to be reviewing the momentum and impulse equations. We're not going to look at graphs or anything like that. In this video, we are just going to look at equations. Okay. So the first equation we really need to focus in on is the equation for momentum. So remember that momentum is also known as mass in motion. Okay. So any object that has mass and is moving is going to have momentum. We can calculate my momentum, which is represented with the letter P, by doing mass times the velocity. Okay. Now you might be thinking, okay, so I do mass times velocity, but what does that number really mean? Well, what that number really means is how hard the object is to stop. Okay? So there's kind of two ways we can be very difficult to stop. So we could have large mass. So think about a train. Or we could have fast velocity. Think about like a speeding bullet. Okay. Both of those objects are going to be very hard to stop, but for very different reasons. Okay. So when you calculate the momentum and you get a number like 4, that represents how difficult it is to stop that object. Okay. So let's talk about units for momentum. So again, we can always start with the equation P equals mv. So mass is measured in kilograms velocity in meters per second. So if I was to combine all of those like I would multiplying fractions, so I multiply all of the letters across the top and everything across the bottom, I see that the unit for momentum is a kilogram meter per second. There's not a shortened unit or anything like that, it's just a kilogram meter per second. Momentum is also a vector. Okay, which means direction matters. Okay, so we got to remember that our positive directions are going to be up, right, north, and east. And our negative directions are going to be all the opposites of that. So down left, south, and west. Okay. So vector matters. So where do we get the direction for the um, momentum? So the momentum direction, I'm just going to abbreviate momentum with a P. So momentum direction depends on, should be two words, on velocity direction. So if the velocity is directed to the left, the momentum is also directed to the left. The next thing we need to talk about is this idea of impulse. Okay. And if you remember, I frequently called it gym pulse to be funny. Now the reason why I call it gym pulse is because the idea of impulse is represented with a letter J. So we have J equals FT equals delta P. So that's what's on our reference table. And the other thing to remember is that when we talk about a change in momentum or what this delta P represents, change in momentum, okay, we're really talking about a mass times a change in velocity. Since we're not really going to be changing our velocity in an interaction, or our mass, sorry, we're not going to be changing our mass in an interaction between some external force and an object. So we say that a force over a given, or I should say applied, applied during a given time period causes a change in 
momentum. So we sort of have a cause and effect relationship here between forces and change in momentum. The force is the cause, the effect, a change in momentum. Okay. So our force examples, okay, and remember these are external forces, okay, we might have gravity that's causing a change in momentum, like an object falling. We might have friction causing a change in momentum, like an object sliding across the surface and slowing down. Or we might like to have, or we might have what I like to call a floating hand. So essentially some outside applied force. So those are all things that can apply or create <coughs> Changes in momentum, and that is not an exhaustive list by any stretch. We could also have tensions. We could have pretty much any force that you can imagine. As long as it's applied during a given time period, we're going to see a change in momentum. Okay. So because of this, we can also say the opposite of, is true. Right? If there is no external force, that's what Fx means, then there is no change in momentum. Okay? So it works both ways. If there is an external force, then there will be a change in momentum. If there's no external force, then there is no change in momentum. Some things to keep in mind is that impulse is a vector, which again means direction matters. So where does the direction come from? The direction for the impulse is the same as the direction of the net force. So sometimes we might need to do some net force equations like F1 minus F2 or whatever. For the most part, not really. but Direction for impulse is the same as the direction of the net force and causes a similar, really same direction in the change in velocity. Okay. So if our net force is negative, then the impulse is negative, and that also means that the change in velocity is negative. Now remember, a negative change in velocity does not mean that we are slowing down. Yes, we will probably have to slow down because we're probably going to be changing directions, but it doesn't mean that we end up slower than we started. Okay. So that change in velocity and change in momentum, remember delta always means final minus initial. That is one thing that does get messed up a couple of times. So if you're doing delta P, it's actually P final minus P initial, if you're doing delta V, V final, minus V initial. One thing to, of course, be really, really careful of, we gotta watch the negative values, values, okay? Especially with that subtraction sign, because the negative for an initial would turn that subtraction sign into an addition sign, which would, you know, if you forgot the negative, makes a big difference. And then the last thing we're going to talk about in this video is the idea of conservation of momentum. Okay. So this is something we've talked about in class, is that in order for there to be a conservation of momentum, there must be no external net force, which means we are in a closed system. Now, it doesn't mean that like our two objects are in a box. It just means that there's no external forces acting on them. So the objects within the system can exert forces on each other, but those are considered internal forces and end up canceling out in any net force equation. Okay, that's what makes it a closed system. So when we're dealing with conservation of momentum in this idea of closed systems, we usually want to have the objects involved in the interaction 
or the collision or whatever is happening. So the objects involved in the interaction are the system. So if we have two cars colliding, then we should use the two cars as the system. Because if we just pick one of the cars, then the exter then the force from one car on the other is now external and we can't have conservation of momentum for a single object. So essentially for conservation of momentum, we need two objects in our system. Okay. So the major conservation of momentum equation we use is M1V1 plus M2V2 is M1V1 prime plus M2V2 prime. And remember that that prime just means velocity after. Okay. So with this equation, there's a few things to keep in mind. Okay. A few things to keep in mind. Sorry, my pen's not working that great today. A few things to keep in mind. First is that momentum in a closed system is conserved in all directions. So what does that really mean? Well, it means that we would have an M1V1X plus M2V2X is M1V1 prime X plus M2V2 prime X. And we also might would have M1V1Y plus M2V2Y is M1V1 prime Y plus M2V2Y prime. Whew, that was a mouthful, okay? So yes, you might need components. Need components. But we all know how to do that by now because we've done it a lot. Okay. Now, a lot of the times these two-dimensional collisions are very conceptual, not a lot of math. But I just wanted to make sure we addressed it so that if we come across a question dealing with 2D momentum, we know how to approach it. We just have to separate the X and the Y direction, very similar to what we did in forces, and approach them both separately. Okay. Some things to keep in mind is if the system starts at rest, then the total momentum of the system is zero, okay? But that does not mean, so doesn't mean the cars end at rest, okay? So we could have, and what's a really common problem, is two boxes with a spring, okay? That spring is then released and the two boxes fly off with equal but opposite momentum. So their total momentum is still zero, but they are now moving, okay? Similarly, a system might end at rest, so we have two objects heading towards each other with a total momentum of zero, okay? And that type of system might end at rest because the momentums end up canceling each other out. So watch out for things like that. Systems starting at rest and systems ending at rest and what that really means. Okay? It doesn't mean that we have no momentum for each individual object. It just means that our total momentum for the system is zero. Okay? Then we also have sticking collisions. Okay, so if we have sticking collisions, this is when we go from one object moving or two objects moving, and then all of a sudden, okay, the objects are moving together as one. Okay, so if this is the case, our equation might look like M1V1 plus M2V2, and if they're moving together as one object, we can treat them as one object by saying M1 plus M2 meaning the total mass of the system times the system's velocity. So these are all conservation of momentum examples. And one thing that we also need to keep in mind is some information about the center of mass. Okay. So remember the center of mass 
is essentially the balance point of the system. Okay. And the velocity of the center of mass, which I'm going to represent as VCM, is conserved or constant when momentum oops, is conserved. Served. Okay. So in these examples up here, okay, in the first two where we are either starting at rest or ending at rest, in either case, the velocity of the center of mass is going to be zero. Okay? And we can think about the velocity of the center of mass as being kind of like the total momentum equals the total mass times the velocity of the center of mass. Down here, the velocity of the center of mass is going to be whatever V prime is. So once they're moving together, the center of mass, if they're moving together, is also going to be moving at that same speed. So it's going to be whatever V prime is. That's some kind of shortcut stuff. So center of mass is the balance point of the system, and it is conserved or constant when momentum is conserved, so when we have that external force of zero. Okay. <coughs> now, again, I keep saying the external force is zero. When two objects collide, they exert forces on each other. So let's say we have box A and box B. So box A feels a force when these two boxes collide to the left from box B. And box B feels a force to the right from box A. So box FBA means the force of box B on box A. FAB is the force of box A on box B. Okay. But these are considered internal to the AB system. Okay. And then they end up canceling out because Newton's third law says that in any interaction, the forces between the objects are equal in magnitude or amount, but opposite in direction. So if I was to write out a net force statement, I would have FAB minus FBA. But they're equal to each other, so the total net force ends up being zero for the AB system. Okay. So they each have forces acting on them, which is what's causing them to change their momentum, but the total momentum for the system remains the same. Okay. So we can write that out in a different way. We can say, all right, well, we know the total momentum for the system has to be zero. So that means the change in momentum for A and the change in momentum for B must be equal and opposite. And that makes sense because the change in momentum is really the force times the time. And the time of the collision is going to be the same. The forces are the same. So, of course, the changes in momentum are going to be the same, but opposite directions, which, of course, is going to lead to a change in momentum of the system as being zero. Now, again, this whole idea of conservation of momentum throws out the window if we have some sort of external force. So maybe the surface we're on is tilted or there's friction or something like that. But for the most part, momentum is conserved. And last thing I want to talk about is elastic collisions versus inelastic, okay? Now, it doesn't matter what name it is. As long as the net force is zero, momentum is conserved okay? in both of these. Momentum is conserved as long as the net force is zero. So, elastic collisions, we usually have some sort of bouncing, usually, okay, 
And inelastic can kind of be any collision. Actually, all collisions that we see in real life are going to be inelastic because elastic collisions really only happen at the subatomic level. Like I'm talking interactions between electrons, maybe between ideal gases, but big scale don't really happen. That being said, the AP exam still loves to test you on them because why not? So big difference between elastic and inelastic. Elastic collisions, kinetic tick, energy is conserved. So no matter how those objects interact, the total kinetic energy is conserved. So if we have two objects interacting, it's going to look like Ke1 plus Ke2 equals Ke1 prime plus Ke2 prime. Okay, and this is going to be the same on both sides. Okay, it's not the total energy, it's just the kinetic energy is conserved. Okay, in an inelastic collision, kinetic energy is not conserved. Okay, so most common examples of inelastic collisions are the kind of stereotypical pop apart because you go from zero kinetic energy to some kinetic energy or the ones where you have two objects heading towards each other and then they collide and come to a stop because then all of the kinetic energy goes away so this one down here is usually considered completely inelastic meaning we lose all of our kinetic energy okay Again, just kinetic energy, not total energy. And that is pretty much it for uh, momentum. So, the end.